Worldwide, disaster response is growing fast. More people are helped in more countries and in far more complex and often dangerous situations than ever before. Tens of millions of people are fleeing from hunger, poverty and war. Even so-called natural disasters are complicated by politics, economics and conflict. The politics of the crises we deal with and the cost of disaster response mean that there are far greater pressures on aid agencies and aid workers and greater vulnerabilities for the people we are trying to help. Success or failure in delivering assistance is dependent on the strength of our own ethical and professional standards. To work effectively, we need clear and common values. We must see ourselves as professionals, like doctors or lawyers, practicing impartiality and independence in our work. This video sets out the ten principles of the Code of Conduct for the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement and non-governmental organizations in disaster relief. In a world of more disasters and more people needing help, we face challenges, choices and dilemmas about what we do and how we work. The right to give and receive aid is a fundamental principle which should be enjoyed by people everywhere. As aid agencies and aid workers, we have an obligation to give aid wherever it is needed. Our priority must be to meet the most urgent needs of the most vulnerable people. Relief aid must be based upon a thorough assessment of the needs of the disaster victims and the local capacities already in place to meet those needs. Good relief depends upon knowing what people need and what resources are available. Where the needs are so great that choices have to be made, relief must go to those who need it most. Aid must be given regardless of the race, creed, or political inclination of the recipients and without adverse distinction of any kind. Women make up the majority of disaster survivors. Meeting their needs is crucial. Humanitarian agencies and workers have many motivations, but our political and religious opinions must not influence what we do, how we do it, or who we try to help. There should be no preaching about the benefits of one political system or the truth of one religion over another. There should be no indoctrination in refugee camp schools. Humanitarian agencies must be independent from governments. We take our own decisions and make our own priorities. When accepting money and help, we should not seek to implement the policy of that government unless it coincides with our own priorities. We exist to serve the needs of others, but we must not denigrate the traditions of the communities we work with. We must take the time to listen to and talk with those we seek to help. And we must consider practical issues like what type of food people expect to eat or the clothes they expect to wear. All people and communities, 
even in disaster, possess capacities as well as vulnerabilities. Where possible, we must strengthen these capacities by using local markets and employing local staff, local drivers, helpers, and skilled labor. Local professionals like teachers should be used instead of expatriates. Disaster response must be well coordinated. We should work through local government and community organizations as partners in planning and action. Relief should never be imposed on disaster survivors. Effective relief can be best achieved when those we help are involved with all aspects of the work we do. This means group discussions with beneficiaries and their representatives, and particularly with those groups who are often ignored, minorities and women. We should be aware that all relief actions, even short-term emergency aid, affect the prospects for long-term development in a positive or negative fashion. Many programs have an environmental impact and there is a risk of encouraging dependency on external aid. We must think what happens after basic needs are met. For example, food aid can be used just to feed or in food for work programs to reforest land or rebuild homes. Looking to the future, relief work can involve basic education on health care. Who are humanitarian agencies responsible to? Accounts and situation reports go back through our headquarters to donors, but we must also discuss what we are doing with the people affected by disaster. In disasters, agencies are often the institutional link between those who wish to assist and those who need help. We must expect to be judged by both groups for how well we spend donated money to alleviate suffering. New evidence continues to come to light about the brutality now sweeping Rwanda. Pictures like these on television or in newspapers show disaster victims as helpless objects who have lost all human dignity. Humanitarian agencies may not be accountable for the actions of the world's media, but as we compete for precious minutes of coverage to influence donors, it is easy to reinforce stereotypes. These pictures provoke feelings of guilt and horror, but do not tell the whole story. So, let's avoid stories of so-called angels of mercy with pathetic victims, and avoid reducing people to objects and numbers. of the Code of Conduct, please contact the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, P.O. Box 372, CH 1211, Geneva 19, Switzerland. <laughs>